Mitaki api. My name is Diane Wilson, and I am Bidewa Kantuan, Dakota. Uh, I am also the executive co-director for Dream of Wild Health. We are a 10-acre farm located in Hugo, where we grow old seeds and youth leaders. And so, and <laughs> yes, it's good work. Um, I was also part of the planning committee, and in our early conversations, one of the things that we talked about was the importance of building trust in the relationships between researchers and Native communities. There's been a lot of hard history in this area, and so this is a very important topic and one that we agreed was um, uh, essential to starting the conversation and core to the work of this conference. So um, to speak about it today, is Abigail Echohawk, who really needs no more introduction. She did such a beautiful job speaking this morning. But just to remind you, she is Pawnee Athabaskan. She is the co-director for Partnerships for Native Health in Washington State University. Um, and her co-presenter, Kenneth Smoker, was not able to be here today. So um, here to speak to you is Abigail Echohawk. Good morning again. I'm um, so excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, this is such an opportunity and I feel very, um, I'm surprised by how emotional I feel about looking out into this crowd and hearing all the words of my co-presenters earlier and to just see the people in this place coming together around improving the health and well-being of Native people through nutrition. Um, so I, I'm feeling very emotional and very um, just excited to be here to have my feet on the land of the people that have welcomed us here. So unfortunately today, we do not have my co-presenter, Kenny Smoker. Um, he is sorry that he's not able to make it. He actually had a, actually, I'll show a picture of him. I told him he's lucky I didn't make a cardboard cutout of him and stand it next to me. <laughs> and attribute anything you guys don't like to him. Um, <laughs> he is the director of the... Um, Health Promotion to Disease Prevention Program at the Fort Peck Tribes in Montana. And I've had the honor of working with Kenny for almost 10 years. And we were going to be sharing about our long-standing relationship. And we actually had the chance to go. And I was on his reservation a couple of weeks ago. And we put together a presentation. So I hope I do it justice. Um, I definitely encourage you to reach out to him. He's one of the most innovative leaders in tribal health that I have ever worked with. Um, his program operates in a way that draws on partnerships from six different universities, multiple different organizations, both faith-based communities, and he gets a crowd of chiropractors there twice a year who bring 25,000 presents for the kids and the youth there on Christmas. So um, I know his information is in there, and he said, feel free to let you guys know um, as I talk about some of our experiences that he's more than willing to be contacted. So I got to tell you guys the story about my uncle, and I just wanted to show you where I'm from. And this is Fish Creek going into Mintasta Lake. So this is the view of my uncle as he dropped those marbles into the water. And as I talk to you today, um, it is in my role as the Director of Partnerships for Native Health at Washington State University, but this is who I am. And when I come and I talk about research, and often this, this label is put on me as a researcher, and I don't use that term, because that's not a term that, that I really have an understanding of, truthfully. It's not my term. Um, I am a person of story, and I was raised in story. And I use data, and I use the health research that we do to inform that story. So today I come to you as a storyteller of health. And as we think about research and what it means in our communities, what is the word that your people had for research? What did research mean to you in your communities? Because we have always been scientists. We have been scientists since time began. One of my elders in, um, at the, she is at the um, Shoalwater Bay Tribe in Washington, she told me this one time, she says, it's hard to bridge that gap between what the elders know and how to show it in numbers. Because as somebody mentioned, they want to see numbers. And I'm saying they, <laughs> the man. <laughs> Not that cardboard cut out of Kinney I was talking about, but the other man. Um, they want to see numbers. And those numbers are what inform the funding, inform the interventions, and 
to many people is the validity of the programs. But as a person who was raised in story, who was raised in indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge, I know that that science is already in my community. Where and how do we bridge that gap? How do we quantify our knowledge, and should it even be measured in that way? And who decides how this is done? These were many of my questions I started doing and working for the university almost 10 years ago, and it has been a journey, and I'm gonna share with you that journey and my experiences um, working in the Fort Peck Reservation with the stories that, that Kenny has allowed me to share with you today. And for anybody who knows me and has been seeing me in the last year, this is something I'm talking about a lot. You may have seen this before as we talk about equality versus equity. And equality says that we give everybody the same amount of money, we give everybody the same health intervention, and everybody gets the same thing. Now we know that as people who have experienced um, colonization and trauma that sometimes equality, most of the time, is not working. So there is this movement and a, continu a continuing movement through public health and other health institutes to think about equity instead. That certain groups of people need more in order to be at the same level as everybody else. And so as a public health practitioner myself, this is often the narrative, the story that I am given, and the one that I'm told I need to be telling to everybody else. I began to question this and think, you know, when I look at this picture and I think about these guys all standing there, they're looking at this game, and in this we, we think of the game as health, is as me as an indigenous person, as a Pawnee Athabascan woman, is my, am I looking at the same game? Are you looking at the same game? Is it a game I even want to play? Is it one that I even want to learn? And that's where we are right now with research. We need to be questioning these ideas that are imposed at many times on our communities of this is what health is supposed to be. The health of a Pawnee woman is different than the health of a Diné woman because our unique cultures, culture and experiences shape us in different ways. Some similarities, but in different ways. So I want us to think about in my presentation to imagine what it would look like instead for us to break free of this narrative of what health is and instead be grounded in our own culture. And for me, you know, my brother-in-law takes what I say and creates graphics for me, thank God, because I could never do it myself. <laughs> And I told him, I said, Matt, you know, when I think about who I am, I'm connected to my Mentasta Mountains, to that creek that I told you about, and that's where my eyes are. That's where my hands are in the soil of. But at the same time, I recognize there are such strengths within Western tradition that as I think of that baby on her back in that cradle board, that that child, those next generations, is drawing on both of those strengths, the indigenous strengths which is where our faces always need to be, but drawing on those strengths that exist within Western tradition and culture also. Because I'm tired of fences. I'm tired of being told of what health can be, and it's really going through and working with communities that I have learned that individual health and how it's defined and what we are trying to build is that knowledge that passes down from the elders to the youth, and as those generations continue, that knowledge and that space and that indigenous resilience that we all have will continue to grow. So we have, as I said, been scientists since time began. We've charted the skies and sailed across the oceans. We've used plants and animals to heal our people. And tradi these traditional practices have been passed down and have sustained us from generation to generation. And I want to acknowledge, as I talk about research, that research has failed Native people. It's failed many people of color. Oftentimes, there's a scientist who has a really great question in their own head, and they, they go out to solve that question. But their question is not the question that your community may have had. And we have seen research that, instead of changing the health of our communities and contributing, has instead harmed people. But does that mean that we just don't participate? I think of my grandma Katie here and all of what she had told us, and she was a fighter for subsistence um, rights in Alaska, and one of the things she always said is, if I didn't do it, who was going to? 
So we're in a different place than we were 20 or 30 years ago in research. Our ancestors, our relatives, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, they were fighting every day for basic survival. And there are communities and there are people still doing that. But we now have a new generation of people who have been able to reach outside of that everyday survival and begin to look at how do we instead impact the diabetes within our community? What is the knowledge that we need to combat obesity within our youth? These questions that we now ask make us think about how do we participate in research in a way that respects those experiences and the resilience of our ancestors before us because it is because of them that we have this opportunity. And it is an opportunity where we can make brilliant changes within our community guided by the strengths and the knowledges that we all have within our individual tribal nations. Because these people, these ancestors, are responsible for us sitting in these chairs today. They sit with you. Who here has been told they have to implement an evidence-based practice? Pretty much everybody. If you're doing health interventions in your community, evidence-based practice is what we're told to do. And I am a believer in evidence-based practice. But I also believe that you have to ask questions. You need to be asking the questions of, where did that evidence come from? Does that evidence contain any knowledge of American Indian or Alaska Native people? You need to ask, where was this research done? And most often, it doesn't. And that's where research has the ability right now and partnerships with communities has the ability to make, it, to make an impact, is that we need to be our own, we need to be our own evidence. We need to establish our own evidence. In the words of Kenny Smoker, he's always telling me, we need to be who we say we are. And if we say that we're going to be caring for our elders and growing our youth and changing our communities, we have to look at every available opportunity and how we can do that in a good way that meets the needs of our community because the evidence is there. As a kid, I grew up chewing on this little piece of bark if I had a little bit of a headache or something like that. And I didn't know when I went into college, they're like, do you know that aspirin comes from this birch tree that I grew up chewing? That knowledge has been in my family for thousands of years. It was not discovered, quotation marks, by whatever scientist now has the patent on it because that knowledge was in my community. And we are going to be able to grow and strengthen that through types of participatory research. But we have to think about how do we meet in the middle of that? Because research meets two, meet, two needs. One is for the researcher. They're building their careers off this. This is something that they're trying to establish evidence and many of them have such good hearts to just improving the health and wellness of people. But we, as Native people working in research and in our communities, need to also be thinking, how does it meet the needs of the community? And often Western research comes in and they'll say things like, you need to have scientific rigor. And what that means is you follow exactly A, B, C, D, E, F. You follow it directly so that we can write about it and it has that rigor. And I believe in scientific rigor. I also strongly believe in cultural rigor because the needs and the culture of our community has to be at the same level as that scientific rigor, and often it's not. But we have opportunity to have and to put that there. And in our partnership with Kenny Smoker at the Fort Peck Reservation, we have done, uh, currently we're on our seventh project. I actually subcontract almost a million dollars to him for staff and facilities to implement several different research projects. And one of the things he always insists on, I actually left it in my purse back there, I was just there, is that we think about the needs of their community and the sustainability. So he, he has given me a copy of the Montana State um, Centers for Medicaid brochure because before I bring him a project, I need to have gone through that and said, here's where you can make this sustainable within your community. That is one of the demands that he has on research that comes into his community. And it is one I am more than willing to be a part of because he wants to be who he says he is. There we go. So one of the um, 
most powerful ways to do research right now in, in tribal communities is community-based participatory research. And we have amazing practitioners of that currently here today, Michelle Johnson Jennings, Tiffany Beckman, Alex Adams, lots of people who are doing amazing work in tribal communities. And what does it mean to do that? Community-based participatory research, I'm gonna read you um, what the Kellogg Foundation uses as a definition in one of their fellowship programs. It's a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves partners in research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. CBPR begins with a research topic of importance to the community and has the aim to combine knowledge with action and achieve social change. So that's a lot of like blah, blah, blah academic words. <laughs> when I think about CBPR, it brings to mind this, this is a picture from um, an activity that's done in the northern parts of Alaska. It's called a blanket toss. It's normally made of seal skin stitched together. And they would toss somebody into the air and they would look and see, are there icebergs? Is there whales? Is the hunting conditions good? What is the water conditions? It was a traditional way of both looking and then also of traditional feats of strength. And so this continues in our World Indian Eskimo Olympics, which are held in this picture I actually took in um, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. But the thing about it is if you see all those people down in the bottom, and this is what CBPR, community-based participatory research, should be, that the person who is being thrown into the air, and think about this as your health interventions, your research projects, they are completely dependent on the people in the circle. And the people in the circle each hold on to that seal skin, and they catch that person, and they also fling them into the air. And sometimes there's a bounce that sends somebody, I don't know if you've ever seen on trampolines, where you go this way when you really intended to go that way. And I know I have many projects that I intended to go up that went real sideways. But in this, when that person goes sideways and then thrown up, is the people below them move together to shift that blanket underneath them. In a true CBPR relationship, that is the relationship you have. Researchers and community members working together to be underneath, to adjust for those times of hardship so that you can build on these strengths together. And it's about learning from each other and respecting the knowledge that they each bring. Because when you get thrown into the air, sometimes it can feel very alone. But when you have that group of people underneath you, there comes a strength from that that I can't even describe to you. So Kenny and I put together some um, guiding values of what our partnership has been built on. We've been working together for almost 10 years on projects ranging from suicide prevention, diabetes prevention, um, substance abuse, cardiovascular disease, cancer. And despite the topic area, there are some key things that we, that we had to work on. We had to build trust with one another. We had to seek out partnerships. He has partnerships, like I said, with many different universities. You go into his office, he's got all of the flags of the universities hanging on his wall. You need to build those partnerships and you need to think about equitable sharing of the funding. Like I said, with Kenny, I try to subcontract. I do um, work with the National Institutes of Health. I know I can sub subcontract 45% of that. Um, I almost, it's about a million dollars per year that we're currently working on with him and our different projects. You need to see where the funding's going and ensuring that there's an equitable share going to the community. You need to think about areas of bureaucracy that are limiting your partnership. If you've ever worked with a university, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot. <laughs> So he and I have worked very closely together to look at where are the things with the subcontracts, the areas that we need to look at where, you know, they didn't take into account um, certain tribal processes for getting approvals. What are the bureaucracies and how do you work together? But most important, be present and be transparent. So despite whether or not we had a project, I was still there. My faculty were still there. Whether or not we were funded because we believed in each other's partnerships and we rely on one another and we are present and we are continually transparent about the projects and what needs to be done on them and what's working and what's not, because what's not is just as important. Think about sustainability. So like I said, he gives me, he won't do a project unless it, he can at some point bill CMS, Centers for Medicaid, for the project at the end of it. 
So it's, he wants to build our own evidence, but he also wants to ensure that whatever we do with research is something that's sustainable within his own communities. Part of the sustainability is creating opportunities for American Indian Alaska Native researchers to do research that is built with communities so that they are growing their careers. Because we need more Tiffany Beckmans. We need more my faculty, Lonnie Nelson, Amy Sinclair. We need those people in the universities, in the research world, in the administration in DC. We need those people and opening opportunities for them and granting them grace when they make mistakes is so important for communities to do because we need those people to be the ones who are leading the charge and saying, we are going to create our own evidence and it's going to be based in our culture and in our tradition. We must respect traditional knowledge. Um, every time I go to the Fort Peck Reservation, Kenny brings together a group of elders for me to talk to. And that could be on, like I said, any topic. And sometimes I just have them for lunch. And I have made such great friends. And my faculty get to experience that they never would have anywhere else. We must respect the knowledge that's in the community. And part of that is help, it helps create a research agenda between the communities and the researchers. Because we learn from each other, we have to incorporate local knowledge. I will tell you every project that I've ever had that failed was because I had a researcher who was not willing to adapt their intervention for the local community. And they fail. And they don't want to fail. And at times in my role, I have to call them out on that and tell them, and that is the responsibility of the community too and those of us in the academic institutions to say, you're making a mistake. You need to be incorporating the local knowledge. It cannot be built by ourselves. Because together is how we learn. And together is how we've always learned. Through stories, through traditions. Because we need to be moving forward and recognizing that the strengths of our community, the science we already had, can only benefit from the strengths of Western tradition if we are present in it. I do not suggest you just let a researcher come into your community and you see them at the beginning of their project and at the end of their project. Because that's not gonna be a project that is beneficial to either one of you. Because we wanna tell our own story, we don't want offense. We're gonna lead the change and identify the gaps because right now when we look at evidence-based practice, there are gaps. We don't always know what's gonna work in tribal communities. We have to identify those gaps and identify gaps in scientific knowledge. Because when we identify those gaps, we're looking at those mountains. We're drawing on that river. And our children are being carried into the future because they are our strength. So I'm going to finish. If you didn't notice, I like stories. Um, I'm just going to finish with a story um, shared to me by my aunt, Deb Echowak, who is the seed keeper of the Pawnee Nation that was um, entrusted to her. And I was visiting recently with her, and she told me the story. It was one that I didn't know. Um, the Pawnee people were moved from Nebraska into Oklahoma at the end uh, of around the 1870s. And during that time, um, I didn't know this. We came together, and we had a good relationship with the non-Indian people there. And we came together at the end, and she said, the stories are is that we hugged each other, with, and we cried. And those settlers that were there wanted us to stay. And we had good relationships with them. And then we were moved to Oklahoma, and our seeds, which come from, we are um, people who believe that we come from corn. We are related to the corn. And when we weren't able to grow that corn in Oklahoma, we lost ceremonies. We lost culture. We lost part of who we were because our corn didn't grow. But we've seen a resurgence of that. And part of it comes from this story I'm just going to tell you very briefly. So my Aunt Deb told me, she said, you have to think about it like this. She said, when the creator sent down the first mother, the first mother was the corn. He sent her. And then he opened up his arm, and out of his robe came the buffalo. And the buffalo roamed onto the plains to provide for the people. So a partnership that she had at the University of Nebraska about 12 years ago, she got a call. And there had been an excavation of a Pawnee village, and under five feet 
five feet of silt on a river where they know there has not been buffalo since 1863, they found the skull of a buffalo. And inside the, the skull of that buffalo were some of our seeds, our traditional Pawnee corn, buried underground, waiting. And those partners worked with her and gave those seeds back to my Aunt Deb. And when I think about who we are and what that means to us is that for the trauma that has been placed on us is we as people are rising up out of that dirt. And that buffalo head with that corn in it is not, it's not magic. It was placed there by the creator for the people. Because as we think about our children, and we think about those next generations, they are the seeds. So as we germinate those seeds and created the ability to grow our corn, that seed went into the ground and out came that stalk of corn. And each kernel that was encased in there was those seeds, our children. And it is our responsibility to care for those seeds and to grow them into strong, brilliant, resilient, cultural people so that they continue to care for those next generations. So today, this is in my head, and I've been thinking about this since I got here, is that I think about my children right now and my nieces and my nephews, and I am the soil, and they are the seeds. I want them to stand in power of who they are and where and how they were meant to be as Pawnee Athabascan children. And I refuse to let anything stand in my way. And I ask of all of you, be brave in times where there is bureaucracy and structures that don't allow us to do that. Because there is no barrier that we can't break or we wouldn't be here today. So be that soil and care for those seeds.